is new, and uh, to your book groups that is, you've been around quite a long time. Uh, we're very, very excited to have you here. Please welcome Mara Wilson.
a child like you. And she smiled, and she had no teeth, like a baby. And for a moment, Norea thought that maybe she was a child. There was still wreckage floating in the pools, the old woman told them. If they dove in, found something that looked as if it belonged in a home, and brought it up to the hill, they could be rewarded. But don't go over the cliff, she warned them. The groans there might want your blood. So that was how they spent the day. The pools rose and fell slowly, and they dove in over and over, looking through the brine and grit, grabbing with their hands and feet anything that didn't feel like rock or weeds. Norea first found a wooden leg of a seat, and Mila found a spoon. Norea found a metal pot, and Mila found a doorknob. They both found a mattress, but it was too heavy to lift. The groans on the hill nearly wept when they saw what the girls had dragged up for them. And the girls looked away, as always. Their mother appeared after the last light of the day had faded, her eyes red and her hair knocked out of its knot. She scowled when they told her what they had done and complained that they could have used what they found, but was quiet enough when they showed their coins. Better things were bought with coins. That had been a long time ago, thought Maria. The sea hadn't taken their mother yet, but it would soon. Does everybody know? said Maria. Her mother had gone the night before, but her mother went for many reasons. No, but they will soon, said he. Mila's not here, said Maria, starting to feel a little concerned. So, said he. Norea stepped out into the sun, reluctantly. She looked for Mila, but she couldn't see her. There was only a worried-looking boy about Mila's age, standing with his thin donkey, looking out toward the sea. I'll come, said Norea. At first, there weren't any people at all. There were, then there were a few groans, smelling of rotten fruit mash, falling out of the pubs which were all old wood and rubble smashed together. Then more and more groans emerged as they passed the homes made of concrete, stumbling past them, running, moving up with the land, shouting past each other and trying to see if they could get higher. Good luck with that, he always said. Alma came barreling out of one of the concrete homes and threw herself at Norea. She was small and brown, and her hair covered part of her face and most of her little body. I want to come with you this time, she yelled. I want to come. We said you could, he said, already a little exasperated. Good, said Alma. It's so boring up here. You have to lie on the ground and the baby stink, and you can't see nothing, really. Where's Juno? said Norea, slightly hopeful. He's with the babies, said Alma. Oh, said Norea softly and looked down at the ground. Stupid thing to do, said he. He is not stupid, said Alma. It doesn't take babies. Of course it takes babies, spat he. That's why you couldn't come with us before. You were a baby. Alma made a furious face, the kind she made when she was trying to figure out if someone was lying to her. But even if she was, it didn't matter. Norea shifted from foot to foot, trying to keep the hot black from burning her feet. It would be better as they got closer, as the black disappeared, the concrete buildings got smaller and became small concrete remains, the trees got fewer, and there was no sound but the quiet of the sea. He moved ahead of them, leading the way. Her right heel was bleeding, but she didn't notice or didn't care. Her legs, Norea noticed with a sinking feeling, seemed twice as long as they had last year. It was just the three of them when they reached the shore. And there were other children, they knew. They might see them if they looked for them, but they didn't. This was something private, something reverent. Everybody knew that. Alma was still dancing on the sand. What do we do now? She said. We shut up. That's what we do, said he. Alma opened her mouth to protest, but then it came. The hum. 
a hum that would soon become a rumble and then a roar. Maria had heard it before, but she shivered. It seemed louder than it had before. Maria took Key's hand. Alma, watching her, took Key's other. The roar rose, and so did the swells, higher and higher. There it is! There it is! shouted Alma. From far away, it rose up and went higher, past the rocks that were meant to break it but never did. And then a scream. Nerea and Alma turned sharply, and even Key cranked her neck back. There was a grown woman holding onto one of the pillars of the concrete homes, a woman Nerea had never seen before. Her hair was too short for a knot and was a strange color. What are you doing? She screamed, and they could hear her over the door. You need to go! Run! Now! Nerea stared at her. Didn't she know? You have to go, the woman repeated, her voice loud but weak, and her head dropped. She must have been crying. But there was only one thing to do when a grown-up cried, so the girls turned away. The rise rose until it was too high, higher than the sun. Then it started to fall, going from green to blue to white. And then the white was all around them, cold and singing, but not hurting, and it wouldn't take you, not now. But the blue and white went past the pink of the buildings and the green and yellow of the trees, then came back again, pulled back into itself, the seas now. And there was a mix of white and pink and brown rushing back past them, and a bit of red, bright red. But it was still white and blue around them, and it was loud. Had it always been that loud? And then there was no sound at all, just what had always been in there, what you always felt, just more, and you held on, and on, and again, and again. Then there was light. It stung under his eyes. Alma was taking deep breaths in and out, finally quiet, her wet hair clinging to her. She met Nora's eyes and smiled a gap tooth smile. Then her eyes went wide, and she looked down at her hand. It was empty. Key, said Alma. She turned back toward the town, back toward what was now nothing. Key, Alma called. She took a few steps up the beach, tentative, then broke into a run. She ran away. Norea heard herself say, in a voice that sounded so much like Mila's and like Key's. She must have run away. On her legs. Those now grown legs. Alma stopped. She turned back to Norea, her eyes full of tears. She nodded. Norea held out her hand, and Alma came and took it. And they moved back hand in hand, toward the water's edge, to watch the swells rise once again. So, and now for something completely different. Um, this other piece that I have to read is, uh, is um, about sort of a love-hate relationship I had with uh, the guy in my middle school and high school class um, who uh, was always the first best writer in the class, which ensured that I was always the second best writer in the class. Uh, and a fun thing about me is that I grew up in Burbank, California. And I don't know if any of you know Burbank, California. If you do, you might know it from the credits of some cartoons. And uh, there are two people in this story who dated in middle school and one of whom is the, uh, the child of somebody who had a big part in creating uh, Darkwing Duck. Another person in it is the child of somebody who created uh, an animated series about uh, another superhero, a much more serious masked superhero. 
And they dated in middle school, and I didn't think about that at the time. They obviously didn't stay together because it was middle school and it would have been terrible for them. But can you imagine what kind of power couple they would have been? If, you know, one of your parents creates uh, Dark and Dove and the other creates, you know, Batman the Animated Series, like, that is a Burbank power couple right there. So, uh, this one is called Stephen's Last Night in Town. Got to get down with electrolytes. Alright. And this one's a little bit longer. Um, Stephen's Last Night in Town. He's charmed everyone here, except Tamara Easter, who later revealed to him her innermost secrets. But we thought he was gone, and now he's come back again. Last week it was funny, and now the joke's wearing thin. Because everyone knows now that every night now will be Stephen's last night in town. Then close by, Stephen's last night in town. His name wasn't actually Stephen. My friend Teresa always called him Charles because, she said, he looks like a Charles. Our eighth grade science teacher always called him Ryan, and we had to keep correcting him. We found out later it was because he'd been watching a lot of Whose Line Is It Anyway and thought he looked like Ryan Styles. I could never see it personally. I think I first met Stephen at a gate pullout day in fourth or fifth grade. Gate was gifted and talented education. It meant that you did well on a test in third grade, so you got put in advanced classes, and sometimes got pulled out of school for little field trips where you participated in mock trials or talked about moon rocks. Stephen was also in Gate at a different school, so we must have met, but I wasn't interested in boys then, and he slipped my mind. But something changed in me the summer before sixth grade. I started having crushes. Big crushes, that is. I had a few small crushes before that on my actually gay preschool boyfriend, Alex, on two boys in my third grade class named Jareth, yes, after Jareth and Lavern, and Garrett, both of whom wore their mushroom cuffs very well. On Aaron, the only other Jewish kid in my grade. I also had tons of crushes on girls, which I didn't recognize as crushes, just as admiration and really wanting to be best friends with. But none of my crushes were as all-consuming as the kind of new feelings that developed in me the summer I turned 11. My first big crushes were at summer camp, and they were oddly wrapped up in each other. I had a crush on both the unofficial camp DJ, Matt, and Maggie, the older girl, she was 13, Matt himself had a crush on. Maggie was beautiful and cool and nice, but I don't know what I saw in Matt. I guess that while he was obnoxious, cocky, and way too obsessed with his hair, he was cute, and he had what I considered very good taste in music at the time. Beastie Boys, Harvey Danger, Third Eye Blind, 311, Sublime, being from Southern California means never having to say you're sorry you love Sublime. <laughs> My crush evaporated after I saw him grab Maggie's boo as a joke on the camp bus, though. Any attraction in him was dead, even if he and I had slow danced once at the camp formal. I ended up pouring Pepsi in his hair in a misguided attempt to avenge Maggie's honor. Matt didn't take it too well, and I'm not sure Maggie really appreciated the gesture either. I entered sixth grade at my new middle school a month later, wondering if I would have any new big crushes soon. I think I liked the idea of having crushes more than actually having them. It felt like a cool, grown-up middle school thing to do. Having crushes and going out with your crush was what the girls in the Babysitter's Club and Phyllis Reynolds Naylor's Alice books did. Going out meant holding hands and going to movies, little gifts from Claire's and Hot Topic and sometimes even kissing. It meant affection, and it meant status. Unfortunately, there didn't seem to be many nice, cute boys at my middle school, let alone ones interested in going out with me. I spent my first few weeks of sixth grade very disappointed in not having anyone to climb over. But then Stephen started telling funny stories in her room. There's a saying that the 
class clown is the one who streaks at graduation, but the class comic is the one who bribed him to do it. Stephen was the class comic. He was smart, witty, and always able to pull the kind of schemes that would just skirt the line of getting in trouble. He was also a natural storyteller. I think the first story he told was about him getting locked out of his house and accidentally setting off the silent alarm, the, per the police arriving, and him having to prove he really lived there. You know you're a suburban white kid in the 90s when that's a funny story. Apparently, the only form of ID he had on him was his social studies book, where he'd written that this book currently belonged to Stephen the Great. The cop had turned to him, deadpan, and said, This you, Stephen the Great? He also had a story about him and his cousin breaking into the medicine cabinet when they were four and having a down attack party. They just really liked the taste. Stephen came to school a few months into the first semester with a cast on his arms, with a cast on his arm. He broke it trying to jump over a row of trash cans. The last thing his mother had said to him before he left the house that day, he told us, was, just don't break your arm. Maybe you had to be there. Or maybe these kinds of stories were only funny in 1998. Sometimes I think about stories that I have about the 90s, and it feels like the stories my Gen X friends told about the 70s. Everybody, everything seemed unregulated and bizarre and ridiculous. But I've always had a thing for a good storyteller, and he also had pretty eyes, so I immediately developed a big crush on Stephen. I desperately hoped he would ask me to go out with him. But there were a few problems. For one, Stephen was the best writer in the class, and that was in direct conflict with my aspiration to be the best writer in the class. I was insanely jealous of him, and hated that no matter how hard I tried, I was only ever going to be, at best, the second best writer in the class. It's hard to be in a relationship with, or even go out with, somebody you're jealous of. He was also very Christian. Most kids I knew in my hometown were Christian, but some were, capital B, capital C, very Christian. The very Christian kids I knew tended to be pious and shy. They didn't have Stephen's irreverent sense of humor, and I always felt a little weird around them. I knew they knew I was Jewish, and I worried they'd try to convert me, or would tell me I was going to hell, and sometimes they did. Stephen didn't. But it was still weird to me when I heard him say he didn't believe in evolution. We were doing a whole unit on it, and our wonderful teacher, Mrs. Chapman, explained that she knew not everyone believed in it, but it was important to learn about anyway. I knew you could be a Christian and still believe evolution happened. Mrs. Chapman's husband was a pastor, and she was teaching us about it. But Stephen didn't think it did, and that was weird to me. There was also the fact that he didn't really like me, not even as a person. I didn't know how to talk to boys when I liked them, so I usually ended up pulling a hell of a tacky and just teasing the shit out of them. Stephen, understandably, didn't like this, but he gave as good as he got. I'd make fun of a monster's zit on his nose. He'd call me ugly. I'd remind him that his initials spelled out S-T-I. He'd call me a bitch. Really, he was meaner to me than I was to him, but I was always the instigator. Most middle schoolers are awful, and he and I were awful to each other. Still, maybe despite everything we were at odds about, I held out hope that we would, maybe he'd see the light and we'd end up going out after all, become the witty, brighter power couple of the sixth grade. We didn't. He asked Casey Nelson, not me, to slow dance at the Halloween dance. While I watched from the other side of the gym, tears streaking through my Halloween makeup. They went out for a few months before it fizzled out, and I remember he mentioned there was another girl he liked, which I hoped and prayed was me. It wasn't. It was a very studious girl, Bethany, whom I've known since kindergarten. Now, I was a bit of a goody two I was a bit of a goody two shoes as a child, but Bethany always outdid me. In kindergarten, I suggested she watch my favorite show, reruns of Danger Mouse on Nick at Night, because I was very of myself even back then. Bethany responded that she couldn't because it was on at seven and quote, I usually go to bed at seven o'clock, or else I go cr get cranky. 
I couldn't believe it. What five-year-old willingly went to bed on time? And at seven o'clock? In fifth grade, Bethany had her plan touring routine for next year at middle school on display in her binder. She still believed in Santa Claus, and in seventh grade, she sobbed when a substitute gave a bad report on our entire math class because she'd never gotten in trouble like that before. I don't think her parents were cruel to her, although I found her mother terrifying. She was a tall, severe woman who had PTA meetings with my mother and whom I never once saw smile in the 15 years I knew her. After Bethany, Stephen started going out with my friend Lucia, and around that time, something changed. Maybe it was out of loyalty to Lucia, maybe it was because I knew him better and the mystique was gone, maybe it was just that, that stochastic way youthful infatuation comes and goes. But I stopped having a crush on Stephen. Months of writing about his Caribbean Sea blue eyes, and I will check to see if that's accurate this weekend, or dedicating entire pages just to printing his name over and over in my diary, and then suddenly I felt nothing. I'd like to think it was because he was mean to me, but judging from my crush and dating history from middle school until about age 27, it's probably not. Stephen and Lucia broke up at the beginning of seventh grade. After Stephen realized over the summer that dating in middle school was actually kind of pointless, and he should just focus on school and making friends. It was actually a pretty astute decision, but my friends and I hated him for hurting Lucia's feelings. At least until Lucia got over it and turned her affections to Kevin Richardson from the Backstreet Boys. Eventually, Stephen and I settled into a semi-friendly rivalry that went on for years. I watched as English teacher after English teacher would praise him for his writing, and I quietly seethed. It was a relief when, finally, we were in different English classes in 10th grade, and I didn't feel like I needed to compare myself to him. When I reconnected with my beloved English 8th uh, grade English teacher, who now lets me call her by her first name, Kristen, I asked her a bit sheepishly if Stephen had been her favorite writer in the class. Kristen laughed and told me she had always loved my writing, and that Stephen had been a great writer too, but she had never seen the two of us as being in competition with each other. I saw those kinds of rivalries a lot in gate classes, she said. I should have asked her if she remembered the day I told Stephen I liked him. It's easier to floss with barbed wire than it is to admit you like someone in middle school, Lori House Anderson once wrote, and she's absolutely right. Admitting to having a crush means vulnerability, and middle schoolers, as we've discussed, can often be awful and will use any vulnerability against you. Even admitting to having once liked someone means opening yourself up to ridicule. Admitting, admitting that you like someone to them can go so very wrong. You can come off too strong or pick up the wrong moment, and I've done both. The few times I told someone I liked them were some of the most awkward and embarrassing moments of my life. Stephen told us on a Friday morning in eighth grade that his family was moving out of town. This was pre-social media, so while I probably had his AOL Instant Messenger name, that Friday was probably going to be the last time I'd ever see him. Sixth period became a going away party for Stephen, with people revealing all kinds of secrets. Somehow, I felt he was owed mine. Should I tell him? I asked my friends and they told me it was now or never. See them? I said, with two minutes left in our class. He turned to me. Just so you know, because you're leaving and all, I, uh, I had a crush on you in sixth grade. Oh, I knew that, he said breezily. You did? I sputtered, but how? Who? I spun around to look at my friends, wondering which one of them had ratted me out. But it probably wasn't any of them, I realized. When you tease a guy relentlessly, stare at him all the time, and then suddenly freeze up when he sat next to you in science class for a week, he can probably pick up on some awkward vibes. Especially if he's as smart as Stephen was. I felt ridiculous, and was slightly relieved that I'd never seen him again. Then he showed up again on Monday, and I felt doubly ridiculous. It had just been a prank. Stephen was leaning into his class comic persona, 
and he would do even more so. He would do so even more in high school, starting rounds at the penis game, where you go around in a circle saying penis in increasingly loud voices, in the middle of chemistry class, and once daring a kid named Chris to put the metal edge from his ruler into an electrical socket. Chris, a class count clown, did just that, and the socket sent up sparks. Steven wrote on the whiteboard, and I have to explain, a lot of people in the, the, my school at the time were starting metal bands. Um, they were all terrible. It was, it was the age of metal, it was a very bad time for music, but a lot of kids at school were, te- were starting bands. Steven wrote on the whiteboard, like metal, listen to Chris's new band, The Electric Sockets, with their hit single, Sparks. Chris, meanwhile, got suspended. I actually haven't seen Steven since I went away to boarding school when I was 16. We talked a little on Facebook until he deleted his account. Sometimes I feel like he should have apologized for being so mean to me, especially if he had done that all while knowing I had a crush on him. Sometimes I think I should apologize to him. Sometimes I think of him fondly as a friend. We had some good moments, some fun talks. I actually saved some past notes that we shared where we talked about whether or not we didn't understand, whether or not we thought sex work should be illegal. I thought yes, he thought no. We had some good moments, some fun talks, and he even gave me one of my favorite nicknames, Tangent Woman, as I was notorious for going off on a tangent in every class discussion. Yes, I was later diagnosed with ADHD. Steven was one of my first big crushes on a guy, but he was probably one of my last big ones, too. I don't think I'm much of a crusher anymore. In my teens and twenties, I would sometimes pine over someone unattainable, but eventually realized that I didn't actually want to be with them. I just liked the idea of them, and I liked the feeling of infatuation. I'll still develop crushes out of boredom now and then, but I don't take them seriously. Most of my happiest relationships didn't come out of crushes, that came out of a casual friendship, and a feeling like I could be myself around this person. I think that's a lot healthier. A crush might have worked out for Steven, though. He's now married to a woman named Amber, whom we both went to school with. Amber was always pretty and popular, but she seemed pretty nice and down to earth, too, and it's possible that started with a high school crush. Casey, who was Steven's first girlfriend and danced with him at the Halloween dance, isn't actually a girl. They're non-binary and married to a woman. Lucia and I remain friends so distantly. I haven't told her yet that I've actually met some of the Backstreet Boys. Not Kevin Rickerson yet, though. All I know about Bethany, who wouldn't watch Danger Mouse because it was on at 7 o'clock, is what Facebook tells me that she's married to a man who seems to really like golf. She also seems to have a thing for Ayn Rand, which makes me sad, because I always thought of Bethany as smart. (laughs) Steven never mentioned my former crush on him again after that day in eighth grade, and I have him to thank for that. He is still a great writer, and now works for a major film company. That company, like a lot of companies, happens to be in our hometown. As it turns out, Stephen never did actually leave town. Thank you. So I'd like to open it up now to some questions. So you can either come down and, thank you, Thomas. Uh, you can either come down and ask questions here, or if you, um, you know, have mobility issues or aren't able to get up, you can raise your hand and we will bring you a mic. So, anybody have questions? Oh, someone's coming. Hello. Hello. I'd love to know how you got connected to Night Vale. Oh, okay. So, how did I get connected to Night Vale? Night Vale was one of those things where I discovered it independently um, on uh, Twitter in the approximately uh, six months that it was a decent place. I thought that it was really funny in a very dark way. I started following it and then I started listening to the podcast. And after listening to the podcast for a while, I realized that I actually knew people who worked on it because there was a group called the New York Neo-Futurists, who I saw all the time, and I had friends
friends that were in it, and I had friends that worked behind the scenes on it. And uh, I, and uh, Jeffrey Craner was a member, and so was Meg Bashner, who plays Deb, and is married to Joseph Fink, creator of Welcome to Night Vale. So uh, I told them, I was like, oh, hey, I know you guys. I have a bunch of friends in this. And I told them that I was a big fan, and uh, I worked with people on different plays that had worked there. And eventually I told them, I said, you know, I love voiceover work. I would happily do any voice, you know, I audition for anything you want. And I was like, you know, maybe I can play Mayor Pamela Winchell or somebody like that. And they said, well, actually, you think that you would be really good for the faceless old woman who secretly lives in your home? And I said, that sounds even better. <laughs> so I've been doing voiceover work since I was very young. I was in the Werther's uh, original commercial. I was in uh, Batman Beyond. I've done, I, I used to love doing ADR. I still do voiceover work now. I do animation. I do audiobooks. Audiobooks in particular that I really love. Um, I've done pretty much everything except video games, but hoping that will happen one day. But Nightvale is one of my all-time favorites because uh, despite being somebody, or perhaps because I'm somebody who's easily scared, it's always been my dream to be a little bit creepy. Hello. First of all, great Doc Martens. I have the same one now. Thank you. Aren't they great? I was so, I was so happy when Floral Black came back into fashion because that was one of my favorite things from the 90s, and it is, Floral Black is like who I am as a person. So yes. great, great yes. taste in shoes. Um, second. Those of us who listen to audiobooks have our favorite narrators who are one of mine. Thank you. Who are some of yours? Very good question. Uh, especially since I just went to the Audis, the Audiobook Awards, and I got to meet one of my favorites, uh, Ramon De Campo. He is absolutely wonderful. Um, who else do I really love? Catherine Calvin was a queen. She was fantastic. Uh, Bonnie Turpin I got to work with recently, who's like, you know, any, any, was that applause for her? Uh, I highly recommend her if you feels free to talk. She and I also worked on a, uh, she and I also worked on something together uh, written by Alison Bechtel, yes, of the Bechtel test, uh, an adaptation of her comic decks to watch out for. Uh, we worked on that together, uh, which was mind-blowing. Um, Scott Brick is a classic, he's fantastic. Um, who else? I really liked Henry Huber's uh, uh, readings of the Neapolitan novels. I'm, I'm probably going to be drawing a blank on, and I'm going to come up with so much more, so many later on. Um, Kevin R. Free, actually, who I work with on Night Vale and who is one of the nicest people I've ever met, is a fantastic, fantastic narrator. And he has done everything from Murderbot to a true nonfiction story called The Last Slave Ship, which is heartbreaking and horrifying. He is an incredibly talented narrator, and he also does books for kids. So, I mean, he does like the very hungry caterpillar. So, if you have kids, if you're interested in history or you know murder bots, your thing, Kevin Murphy is your guy. I highly recommend him. Also, I went to college with Emily Lawrence and Bailey Carr and Zach Weber, and they're all talented people as well. Great shirt. I actually have a fun story about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, I was in a movie with Simon Jones, the original Arthur Dent. And uh, yes, I know. And my family and I, because I come from a family of nerds, were very excited about that. And uh, I used to play house with his son, and he used to pretend we were getting married. And when I was in college, I dated a film major who was not phased by anything, like he would ride the elevator with Spike Lee at school, you know, he had friends who worked for Martin Scorsese. He was not phased by anything, but then one day I mentioned that I used to play with Simon Jones' son when I was six. And he said to me, so you are Arthur Dent's daughter-in-law? <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, I guess I kind of am, huh? And, uh, you know, I'm the Earthman's daughter-in-law. And, uh, yeah, and so, and Tim, I'm still friends with Tim Jones to this day, and we still joke about that, and, uh, yeah, that would be my, like, uh, what I like to you fun fact is, uh, I'm Arthur Dent's daughter-in-law. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, thank you, and also I just realized I also have those Doc Martens. <laughs> okay, I love this. Like, sometimes it's weird when people have the same article of clothing as you, but honestly, I think that's fantastic. We, we need to form, yeah, we need to form a floral black appreciation society. Definitely agree. Uh, yes. So I have a writer's advice question, mm -hmm. and I'm very nervous, so I apologize in advance. 
uh, how do you know when you have uh, a good story to tell? Because I found that um, like I love telling stories, uh, and uh, I find that when I actually sit down to type them, uh, I find that I decide that uh, I talk myself out of it. I decide that no one would ever want to read this, and I don't actually know what I want to say, and uh, then I kind of give up. So how do you know when you have a good story to tell? That's an issue I also have, and both of the stories I wrote today are, you know, our stories I'm not sure if they're, you know, they're stories that have appealed to friends of mine, and, uh, and so, and I, I mean, a lot of it I think is about audience. Um, a lot of people will talk a lot about uh, your first reader. You know, there's somebody that's going to be the first person to read, uh, read it, and uh, some people write with them in mind. A lot of other people say write only for yourself, write what you would like. But I think for me, what I always think about is that saying that great scientific discoveries don't come from Eureka, they come from, that's interesting, or that's weird, or that's unusual. Like I started thinking about the fact that there was a kid in my class who told stories about guzzling diamond tap and getting in trouble with the cops. And I was like, that was funny to me? How and why was that funny to me? Or I had a nightmare about children surviving a tsunami, and I was like, that's weird, that's unusual. So basically, you think about what, is, what are people not talking about? What is something that you haven't yet heard or don't think that people have? Or what is something that surprises you, interests you, intrigues you? And I think that that's good. I think that there's different things that I've written that would be for different audiences. And I do kind of like the idea of, um, I mean, I always go back to something Jeffrey Kramer worked on Nightdale said, which was, if you're working, if you're working together with people, uh, make things you like with people you love, and that way you will always be happy. But yeah, I think it's really just about finding what's interesting, what's odd, what's uh, fascinating to you, and honestly, that would be great because you will be able to please yourself by exploring these ideas, and sometimes also. I'm mixing a lot of metaphors here. Sometimes also you just need to get something out before you write something good. Uh, my brother Joel calls those ketchup drips. Because, you know, ketchup will drip a little bit on a bun. And then, uh, and then the ketchup eventually comes out. And sometimes you just have to get that out. Uh, so, yeah, some things are ketchup drips. Some ideas are just things that you end up leaving behind, but that's okay because it, uh, it leaves way for the rest of the ketchup to come out, and ketchup is delicious. Do you have any more questions? I will even take some comments. This is one environment in which I will take a comment. And if anybody's raising their hand and we just can't see them, let me know. But and you can ask about movies too. So I have a comment and a few questions. Mm -hmm. First off, uh, my favorite movie growing up is the Killer Oaks. The fact that I'm like 20 feet away from you is ridiculous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what is your favorite project that you've worked on? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, there's so many. I mean, Night Vale took me to places figuratively and literally that changed my life. I, um, I, uh, I mean, Matilda's probably the favorite movie that I was in because it, it was kind of a summer camp atmosphere filming it, and Danny and Rio were so lovely to me, and Pam Ferris, who played Miss Frontal, was probably one of the nicest people I've ever met. Uh, Matilda was very, very special to me. Um, Writing-wise, um, I've written a couple of plays that were really fun to work on. I wrote a play called Sheeple that I don't think aged particularly well, but it was really fun to work on, and uh, it's also been fun because I cast some actors in it who are now like on like uh, musical national tours and like you know successful comedians and on like Netflix shows, and I get to be like they were in my play, uh, things like that, and. Uh, Let's see, audiobook-wise, I've worked on so many books that I just thought were incredible. Um, and the one that really got me started in audiobooks was, um, was uh, a book called One for All, which was a retelling of um, 
it was a retelling of Three Musketeers with actually, it, with, it was gender swapped and also uh, it had really good disability representation. So that was a really fun book that I worked on. And after that, that kind of opened me up into working with audiobooks, which are my favorite things to work on in the world, I think. Uh, and I always tell people it's my two favorite things, reading and talking. So um, yes, I am, I am one of those things that the internet hates. I am an extrovert. Um, but yeah, but, and I love, I love reading. So if I could just read people all day long, you know, that would be my dream. And that kind of is my job now. And then my second question is, what do you think of the musical? I've only seen it, I've seen it on Broadway. I haven't seen the actual movie yet, um, but I've met some of the little Matildas. I mean, they're now like grown up. I met uh, Gabby Pizzolo, who was also, uh, who also worked with Alison Bechtel on Fun Home. It's a, uh, the queer child of the community is very small. Um, and and uh, I, I met her, and a couple years ago I did a, a reading a, a reading series at Symphony Space in New York when Matilda the Musical had first come out. And I think it must have been Bold Dolphy because there were a bunch of people there doing pieces. And there was uh, Sophia Janusa who played one of the Matildas. And I went up to her and her adorable mom and I said, Hi, I'm Mara. And her mom said, Oh, you know who you are. <laughs> and we took pictures together. And I mean, Matilda is an I think she's kind of an archetype by this point, so I kind of can't be like, oh, I have ownership over her. I mean, I'm very proud of our movie, but, you know, she's, she's too big a character at this point, I think, to only be, have been played by one character. So, so yeah, she's, uh, she's been played by many different girls now, and I think that's great. All right, five, okay, any other questions? Oh, hello. I have a comment, since you gave permission. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I'm a movie, I can't handle horror. And the way you read horror is absolutely as creepy and delightful as you like. Uh, I listened to Camp Damascus in one day. I oh just sat my day off just like kind of sitting still listening to it because you did such a good job reading it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I I I mean I don't listen to that many audio horror horror audiobooks. I mean I listened to uh, the Three Body Problem and that's probably as close as I got. I mean technically that is cosmic horror. But uh, yeah, I'm really glad that you enjoyed that. And working with Cam Damascus was, was great. And it's actually cool to know that I've met Chuck Tingle a couple times now. I don't know who he actually is. I don't think anybody does. But uh, yeah, the last time we did an event together, the two of us both showed up in bright pink suits. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. Uh, yeah, uh, I love Matilda, but my, one of my favorite movies growing up was actually A Simple Wish. Oh yeah? Um, do you have any particular favorite memories from working on that film or working with Martin Short? Martin Short was hilarious and very theatrical and very, very sweet. He was a very sweet guy and they'd go cut and he'd start, you know, singing show tunes and being just goofy and ridiculous. He was a very nice guy and I have a lot of fun memories of him just being funny and goofy and, and ridiculous. But I remember we asked him once, uh, me and Francis, who played my brother, we were like, so how old were you when you started doing comedy? And he said, I was probably like 18 or something. And then Francis said, well, how old were you when you realized you were funny? And he said, four. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, he was, he was honest, he was lovely. It was, that was a strange time in my life, so I don't have as many memories of it, but everything that I remember about Martin Short is absolutely lovely. And it's so funny when you work with somebody as a kid and you get to know them differently as an adult, you know? I mean, like, I worked with Tim Curry as a kid and then, you know, I saw Rocky Horror when I was 12 and was like, oh. <laughs> and now one of my favorite things is to watch him go on Conan and just completely, like, destroy him. And, uh, and I just think, yeah, I knew that guy when I was nine. <laughs> All right. We've got time. Oh, hello. Hi. Um, being a child actress and kind of having a path that could have been laid out for you going into adulthood and then transitioning and doing what you do today, like how did you find your purpose and the courage to switch to something else? I mean, that's a big question. And it's, um, I think at the end of the day, it just kind of comes back to who I am when I'm with the people that I know, that know me the best. And I think that I was very lucky that I had, you know, a family and friends 
friends who knew who I was and were willing to support me. And I think that I hold a lot of people very close. I mean, like, I'm on this cruise with my publicist, who's also, like, one of my closest friends. And, um, like, uh, I, I've had, like, friends cut my hair who I was in Girl Scouts with. <laughs> you know, I've had, um, I'm, like, people I went to college with, people I went to elementary school with are still in my life. And I think that, you know, for me, it was just about, I think when I was maybe 17, I asked my, my like, advisor at school, you know, do you think I should take time off and go back into acting? And she just said, would that make you happy? And I said, no, I want to I wanna study theater, I want to write, I want to do voiceover, but I don't know if I really want to get back into acting right now. And she said, well, there you go. So I think that for me, I, I, I think that I'm sort of painfully pragmatic. And I think that for me, it always comes down to, like, would this be a fun project to work on? You know, would this be something that would, would you know, pay me as a job and not an expensive, you know, and, and not be something that I don't really want to do, expensive, you know. I was going to say it expensive my dignity, but, you know, I don't know how much dignity I have. Um, I, I'm, I embarrass myself all the time. But, yeah, and, and it really is just about being true to myself and being true to the people that I, uh, being true to the people who know me best, uh, know, me, know me to be. Hi. Hi. I'm amazed at your multi-talented. Uh, you have such a diverse uh, interest in, in a number of different uh, performance things. This is great. Thank I you. Was, I was looking through the, uh, the list of who our invited performers are. I see Mara Wilson owns that on the her bio. Oh, Matilda, I always wanted to see that. Okay, so like, I finally saw that on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Which is wonderful. I was a new fan of that movie. It was great. Um, but now I find you're a writer and a voiceover and all these things. So I was wondering. Uh, I really enjoyed your readings today. Thank you. Um, not so much in the horror. I love the kind of the personal tale of just human. Um, Emotional adventure, like you know, your tale of Steve and all that. So, as a, as a new fan coming to your writing, what would you recommend us start with? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, let's see. I I'm trying to think of the pieces that I'm very proud of. Um, I mean, I did write one piece called Proust's Madeline for those of us who grew up with a single dad, uh, which was my ode to uh, how much I love things like reheated macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Um, I've written, um, one of my favorite things I wrote was what a straight man's favorite musical says about him, for McSweeney's, based on uh, the, the straight men that I've dated and been friends with. Um, one of them was based on my brother, which was like, it's the music man. He logged more than 90 hours of detention in high school. Uh, uh, it's Wicked, he is Stephen Schwartz. Um, things like that. That was that was definitely hard. I did write a book called Where Am I Now? And I also wrote uh, I wrote a piece called Good Girls Don't that was very personal for um, for a company that used to be called uh, Script and is now called I forget what it's called. It's called Ever Something. Yeah, but look up Good Girls Don't by Mara Wilson for that. And I also wrote one that I almost read today and maybe I should have that was called um, that was called something like uh, the protagonist of uh, like things that were written that could have been said by the protagonist of any 1970s children's or YA book. Um, things like, you know, you know, I live in a big city and, you know, I like to spit on, you know, I like to spit on, spit gum on the people that are passing down by, you know, and like, you know, damn it, heck, and like, and you know, my name is Francesca, but everyone calls me Attila because I'm a real killer. And just that sort of like Judy Bloom, you know, kind of thing. And and yeah, I should probably post that on like Twitter or something because I think that, that would be very nostalgic for a lot of people. But yes, I'm very glad. I'm very glad that you're that you're interested in my writing. And I don't think of myself as multi-talented so much as I think of myself as a dilettante. But uh, it's nice to hear that <laughs> that other people think I'm more than just a dabbler. So thank you very much. So, um, so I will be around. I'm doing a signing later on in the week. And thank you guys again so much for being here. I so appreciate it. And have a wonderful cruise.